continuing our series called My Best Friend, the Holy Spirit. There was an old song. I used to watch a TV program. Remember that? I'm going to date myself. Let me tell you about my best friend. Okay. <laughs> anyhow, I can't remember what Bill Bixby, his name was, I think it was. But anyhow, way back. Yeah, I'm dating myself. But my best friend is the Holy Spirit. And you know what? That's what God wants to do. God doesn't want to be some force that's way out there or some distant father. He wants us to be close to him, to know his heart. He wants to live and reside and guide us together. And so we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, my best friend. And we spoke the very first week, who is the Holy Spirit? And a lot of people would think the Holy Spirit's a lot of different things. Oh, he's a force. Even New Agers now saying, oh, yes, there's the Holy Spirit. And people take our language and then use it the wrong way. It's called God speak where cults and different things will take our terminology and mess it up. Also, it's a life force. It's a power. No, it's not a life force. It's not a power. It is a person. It is the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we spoke the very first week about the Holy Spirit and who he is. We mentioned some key components I wanted to reiterate once again for you. It's very, very important we understand this, that Jesus had a dual purpose to come to the earth. The first purpose was the most important and by far the most important, and that was to be the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. God is a just God. There had to be payment for sin. And Jesus is called the second Adam, where first Adam made a mistake. And what God did through Jesus Christ is that Jesus left his, his divinity in heaven and became one of us. That's why it's called the Son of Man. And he basically had to sleep. He had to eat. He had to do all the things that you and I did. And there was one huge difference between Jesus and you and I. He was perfect. I know some of you think you're perfect, but you're not. <laughs> but Jesus was absolutely perfect without sin. He had to be the sacrificial lamb. And if Jesus were to come 2,000 years ago, if he would have went on the cross, it would have been enough for us to come to know him. He didn't have to do any miracles except from rise from the dead. But that's not the only reason he came. He also came to inaugurate a new kingdom. The kingdom of God is among you. He preached anointed messages where his words were empowered by the Holy Spirit and it penetrated hearts in people and made a difference. He did miracles by opening blind eyes, unstopping deaf ears, raising the dead, walking on water, feeding the 5,000. And he did it, by the way, with the person of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said something extraordinary. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, why on earth you would think you want Jesus here right now? I said, no, I'm at one place at one, one time. I can't do much. But when I leave, I'll send him you. Now, what happened was this. Jesus, when he was 30 years old, went to the Jordan River to his cousin, John the Baptist. Okay, and what happened was when he was baptized, the Bible says the heavens rendered open and the Spirit of God, which the Holy Spirit, descended upon him like a dove, not a bird, but like a dove, which means gently and beautifully, and it remained upon him. And then he was inaugurated into public ministry. And everything Jesus did, he did in relationship with, with the Father, and he did it with the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus said, it's, it's, he says, uh, you'll do greater stuff than I have done because I will go to the Father and I'll send him the comforter. I want to encourage you to go back to our website, cornerstonecheshire.com, and you can, um, you can listen to the first message called Who's the Holy Spirit? Really a key component. I just wanted to touch that briefly. And so what happened was Jesus uh, basically said, don't leave home without it. Not an American Express card. They stole that model from Jesus, Okay. But what he said, he says, wait till you are in power from on high. And the Holy Spirit is for all of those who ask. And it's not just getting the Spirit. We talked about when you give your life to Christ, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit, right? And then they had to wait 10 days, and then they received the gift, the impartation, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about it in coming weeks. All right, and that's what happened, is empowered them to do the work of the ministry. So, many of us, listen, if the enemy can't get us to sin, if the enemy can't get us to deny Christ, then he says, listen, I want to have a church that's not powerful. So, let them embrace Christ the Savior, but man, I don't want them to embrace 
the person of the Holy Spirit, because if that happens, then we have millions and billions of Jesuses going around the globe doing incredible works beyond themselves. And so he would try to mess it up, and he's done a really good job of creating fear, because he's called the Holy Ghost. And I don't know about you, when I was a kid, I was afraid of a ghost, except for Casper, the friendly ghost. Otherwise, you talk about ghosts, I don't want to hear about ghosts or spirits. And that's a translation from the Greek, and it really is a paraclete, one that comes, or pneuma, which is a spirit, which is the breath of God. (laughs) We need God in our lives today. So I want to encourage you today that the Holy Spirit is for us today. And just like Jesus did no ministry without the Holy Spirit, my friends, you and I should be baptized and functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we spoke about Pentecost. And I know a lot of people get afraid. We said we mentioned we were bringing out snakes and you know the Pentecostal buns, and now they have man buns. And I'm thinking about getting one to hide this thing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of this. I worked a long time to get this. Okay, it, it's in style now. But you know the Pentecostal buns can't wear makeup, or you wear too much. We talked about all that, right? We talked about the Pentecostalism. You know what Pentecost means? I know it's really scary. Pent is five to the tenth power. Pentecost meant 50. That's all it meant is 50. We don't need to be afraid of Pentecost. It's 50 days after the Passover, and that's when Jesus sent the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to us, and inaugurated a new age of us being Christ. Greater works will you do because I go to the Father. Uh, The Father has sent me, so I send you. And so the enemy would do everything he can to mess it up. And believe me, there's a lot of stuff that's been weird. People are weird. God's not weird. All right? And, and I mentioned before, I heard people say it. I'm going to mention it again because it's a good illustration. People say, well, you know, we don't need the Holy Spirit. It's been abused too much. Well, that's like me telling you we don't need to use money because it's been abused. Right? That's the same rationale. It's so important that the enemy, if he can't get us to sin, then he'll get us to disbelieve the Holy Spirit. And there's been a lot of arrogance, unfortunately, where we're a spirit-filled church. We're full gospel, but you're not. And it almost got like this parading around like, I'm better. We're the, we're the church of the, we preach the Bible. You know, or we, we speak in tongues. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I've been around for a while, okay? And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I enjoy that kind of preaching. But it's almost like we're better, and it's like we're, let's separate. And that's the last thing the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would have done at Pentecost. It brought people together of different ethnicity, a social economical backgrounds, and brought them all together. And even in Azusa Street, back at the turn of the last century, it brought a one-eyed black preacher, began a revival movement Hundreds of millions of people have been saved through this revival movement that happened in Azusa Street. So listen, it's about bringing people together, but he's been misunderstood. And I want to demyth, take the myth out of it, take the scare out of it, and let you know that all of us can have the person of the Holy Spirit and have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you don't have to be crazy or weird. Okay? Please understand that. Don't let people that have abused it and, and I want to say something else about this. Very, very important. we got to stop this nonsense of I'm spirit-filled and you're not. Or those weird people over there. Stop that. Let's just stop that. It's a not about you or me. It's about Jesus Christ and Him glorified. And so today we're going to talk about is the, is the Holy Spirit charismatic? Is He charismatic? When I say charismatic, what does that mean? Oh, no, charismatic. I mean, they're going to you know, make me fall on the floor and shake, and they're going to make me go, ho, oh, and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, 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 you know, that charismatic stuff's kind of weird. And, or, or am I going to be a cruise-matic? You know what a cruise-matic? A cruise-matic is a charismatic that cruises from church to church to church. Okay, but the charismatic movement, uh, it was a tremendous movement. I don't have time to get into it all, but charismatic, charismaniacs, whatever. People get scared because I don't want to do that weird stuff. I, I don't like all that weird stuff, and I, I don't want to do all that. And, you know, I don't want to be falling on the floor and all, and all that. Listen, I, I experienced it all. I've seen God move so powerfully. If I told you some of the things I've saw, I'd freak you out. I might share another time with you about that. But I've seen God move powerfully in service where the Holy Spirit had tremendous power in our lives. But I've also seen a lot of pride and arrogance where people get, oh, 
I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues. And then some of you have tried for years, and you can't speak in tongues. You feel like, I'm a second-class Christian. I'm not even, I'm not in the first class. I'm not even in coach. I'm in the, I'm in the baggage part of the plane. I, I, don't, I don't feel I'm good enough. I, God must not be for me because I can't speak in tongues. And, and it's really unfortunate that th this kind of nonsense happens in the church where we begin to feel that way. We're first or second class Christians. My friends, it's all about the love of Jesus personified in the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. If you want to understand, spiritual gifts without love is dangerous. And it's very really interesting that the Apostle Paul, we're going to get into a few moments about. Today I want to talk about easy, charismatic. And what does it mean to be charismatic? You know, charis means, you know what it means? It means grace. What does charismatic mean? Charis is grace. What is grace? Something you didn't earn. Unmerited favor. Grace. So charis means grace. You know, charisma means, it only means this. It means gift. So charismatic really means grace gift. In other words, having gifts that have been given to you that you didn't earn your own. You just received it. It's almost like someone living in the, in the someone that's 28 years old, living in their, or actually worse than that, let's say they're 16 years old, living in their parents' basement, and they're driving around their parents' card, car, using their parents' credit card, and bragging how great they are because mom and dad gave it to them, Right? And meanwhile, they're going around to someone else that doesn't have, well, I'm better than you because my mom and dad gave you. No, because mom and dad gave you those gifts, you're able to do it. That's, that's charismata. <laughs> I mean, they have gifts given by the Father, and that's why they're able to do what they're doing. And so, listen, my friends, when anytime we have gifts from God, it should be, it should realize it is a grace you didn't earn, and it's a gift you didn't, you didn't get. Do you follow me? So we shouldn't be bragging about it and walking around like we're better than somebody else. Let's stop that. In these last days, we don't need to be doing that. Guarantee you don't need to do that. So, um, so what it basically means, charismatic, is to be grace gift. That's simply all it means. That's it. What does it mean to be charismatic? What does it mean to have charisma? Charisma is a Greek word. Charisma is the instances, enablement of the Holy Spirit in the life of any believer to exercise the gift for the edification of others charisma is charisma is a gift that god gives us grace gifts to build each other up and to make a difference in the world with the power of god it's about edification of others it's not about bragging it's you're not some cocky boy scout or girl scout with a huge saw with all these merit badges Oh, you're just a brownie, or you're just a Cub Scout. I'm an Eagle Scout. And you got all these things. I speak in tongues. I can, I can raise the dead. I can, and it's all about these things that you can do. And it's all about, look at me, look at me, look at me. And it's not about that. It should always be, look at Jesus. Do you realize that even when Jesus did miracles, he didn't brag? He said, don't tell anyone. I just don't, don't tell anyone. Just go down to the priest. Jesus would purposely stay out of the town. He was never bragging about himself, but he bragged about the Father. He never was arrogant, walked around and, you know, had his entourage, get me this and do this the other. Now, I'm King Tut. What a nut. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like that, right? Jesus was a servant, and he blessed people. And he said, hey, listen, I'm going to do the stuff, you're going to do it. He never tried to have the secret sauce. He says, I'm giving you the secret sauce so you can do the stuff I'm doing. He was an enabler for people to work and live in the power of the Spirit, not a hierarchy. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here this morning? So charismatic is the instance of enablement of the Holy Spirit in the life of any believer to exercise the gift for the edifications of others. And this is what it's about. Now, the Apostle Paul says the following. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, ignorant does not mean stupid. It means uninformed and not aware of something. He says, I don't want you. And by the way, who did who the Apostle Paul, who spoke through the Apostle Paul? Who? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's basically saying, which is God, I don't want you, Cornerstone, all right, to be ignorant about that. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. God wants us to know 
what is going on. He wants you to be aware of spiritual gifts. And that's all part of it. Now, very interesting, it says concerning, now concerning spiritual gifts. Now, this phrase, now concerning, let me explain why it says that for. I don't know if you realize it, but uh, we have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, or some people say 2 Corinthians. But we have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and what that simply is is a letter that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth was a church that was really carnal. They exercised the spiritual gifts great, but they had a lot of problems. And so 1 Corinthians, by the way, is not really the first letter. There's a first letter the apostle Paul wrote that we don't have. This is the second letter. I know it's confusing, okay? 1 Corinthians is 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is 3 Corinthians, okay? You got me? All right? So what happened was he sent a letter to them first, and then they wrote back questions. Okay, Paul, what about spiritual gifts? What do we do with this guy who's sleeping with his mother-in-law? Uh, what do we do about this person who's suing each other? Uh, what do we do in, in, in church? We got people speaking in tongues and, 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 and levitating, and we got people doing crazy stuff in church. What do we do about this, Apostle Paul? What are we supposed to do? So they wrote the Apostle Paul a letter, and then the Apostle Paul wrote a letter back, which is 2 Corinthians. And so that's what happened. In, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, the first letter I sent you, okay, so maybe God said, okay, Paul, you get it together, I'll let you have one in the Bible. Maybe the second one will work better. Now, that's not what happened, but uh, so he basically says, I sent you the first letter. Now, in 1 Corinthians 7, it said, now concerning the letter you wrote me, okay? So 1 Corinthians is a response, and much of it, a response to questions that the church had in Corinth about various things. And so when he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant, because apparently there was a lot of ignorance, and people were misusing it, people were getting hurt. Do you think maybe there's some ignorance in the church today about spiritual gifts? Oh, yeah. There are people that function in spiritual gifts. They, they do. They're bona fide. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They do amazing things for God. But they're arrogant. They misuse them. I mean, was Samson, if you remember Samson, he was filled with the Spirit. Did he live a godly life? No. Just because someone's gifted with spiritual gifts doesn't necessarily mean that they are all got their stuff together. That's another talk, talk for another time. So God does not want us to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. And so what he says. And so I just want to share with you briefly, uh, just bear with me. I know we're not in Bible college or Bible school, but sometimes we have to do a little teaching in church. I call it treaching, okay? And, and there's basically, uh, like Paul, I don't want us to be uninformed. We need to be aware of what's going on. God does not want us to be ignorant. And there's basically, there's four types of gifts in the Bible, generally speaking, in the New Testament. The first one we call, and this is like straight from Bible school and seminary, uh, the first one is called motivational gifts. We get to motivate people, okay? And that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's about the different type of motivational gifts. A second type of gifts is something called, there are the manifest gifts, which we're going to go into today. The manifestation gifts, where the, the Holy Spirit is manif manifested in us. The third one is there's ministry gifts. And then there's also ministerial gifts that's found in Ephesians 4. But today, we're going to talk about the manifest gifts of the Holy Spirit, all right? So let's go ahead and, and look at that right now. Now, but the manifestation of the Spirit, manifestation of the Spirit, is given to each one for why? For the profit of the person doing it so they can write books and make money. No, for the profit of what? All. God gives gifts so we can bless each other. It's not just for ourselves. And so the Apostle Paul talks about that. And he goes on, and let's go ahead and look at the scriptures, move forward with it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Now we go to verse 8. For one is given the word of wisdom, that's the first gift, word of wisdom, through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge, second one, through the same Spirit. To another, the gift of faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. It all comes through the Spirit blowing in us, giving us an ability to do something we cannot do on our own. It's not your personal gifting. It's supernatural enablement to do something you cannot frankly do on your own. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, Different kinds of tongues. Oh, I knew you were going to talk about tongues. I thought I liked cornerstone. Relax. Let me just help you right now. Please do me a favor. Can you please let go of your preconceived ideas?
Maybe you've been abused in the church. Maybe you've been afraid of the church. And when it speaks of the uh, tongues, there are the devil and all that kind of stuff. Please, let's just lay it aside. Let's read the Bible for what the Bible has to say. Go back, read the Bible yourself, and see what it has to say. Nothing to be afraid of, folks. Okay? So, to another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. Why do we have these things? But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing, like a distributor. A distributor takes God's grace and distributes it to different people. Okay? To what? To each one. Look at your neighbor and say, you're in each. Be careful how you say that. Okay? These distributing to each one individually as he wills, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is Christ. So God gives different gifts to different people. Now there are certain, uh, just bear with me one second, there's certain office gifts where God will establish someone that functions in that gift, but basically the context is that we can function in all nine of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is available. God will give it to us at the moment of need. For example, not everyone is a teacher by trade, but we all teach people, don't we? Do we not? You teach your child how to tie their shoes? Teach someone how to balance your checkbook? What's a checkbook? Oh, that's another talk. <laughs> we teach all the time. doesn't mean you're a teacher, right? Some of you share your faith with other people. That's evangelism. doesn't mean you're a professional evangelism. So there's a difference between doing the stuff and being someone that does it all the time. And that's for another time as well, as we look at the scriptures. And so the Bible talks about these things right here. But to one of the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each, each one. Um, let me tell you something. You don't have these gifts. The Holy Spirit will go through you and use these gifts. It's something the Holy Spirit gives you and works through you, all right? And um, you can function, for example, the word of knowledge. Anytime the Holy Spirit comes upon you, God will give you a word of knowledge. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to look at three different manifest gifts. The first types of gift, bear with me here, is the discerning, uh, is the manifest gifts. The first one is called discerning gifts. Now, what's the discerning gifts? Well, discerning gifts are the following. First one we have is a word of knowledge. Now, what's a word of knowledge? Well, I have it, happen to have it right here, okay? If you're taking notes, write it down. If you're not taking notes, write it down. To know something specific without learning it by natural means. Well, God will tell you something. Don't you wish you could go to school and say, Holy Spirit, help me with my SAT? I wish it worked that way. It doesn't. So to know something specific without learning it by natural means. Well, God will give you knowledge about something, not through natural means. And this happens a lot. For example, if you read John chapter 4, Jesus goes to Samaria and he meets a woman at the well. And he talks to the woman who was, uh, you know, that's a story within itself. And he goes to the woman. He goes, hey, where's your husband? And she goes, well, I don't have a husband. He goes, that's right, you don't have a husband. You've had five men, and the one you're with right now is not your husband. Oh, I can see you're a prophet. Okay, that is a word of knowledge. Sometimes God will give you words of situations you don't know about. There's been circumstances, and I'm not saying this to, to brag. I'm just telling you what happened. There's been circumstances where I've met somebody. I looked them straight in the eye. I said, you're going through this, 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 and the other. And they're freaking out. How did you know that? There's been times I've prayed for people. I had no idea what was going on in their life. And you've done it too. You pray for them. You prayed specifically for what I was going through. See, that's kind of, a, kind of a word of knowledge. As a matter of fact, let me give you a little story of what happened to us as a family. Uh, a number of years ago, back in 1982, my dad was a pastor. I grew up in a pastor's home, and we had a disgruntled board member that was very upset with my father, could not stand him or our family. But we didn't know what was going on. We, we'd be driving a car, we'd get a flat. What's going on with our tires? We keep buying these tires. <laughs> We're driving someplace. What's going on, Dad? Another flat. And we, and we go, and there's a, there's a nail on our tire. We get it fixed, buy a brand new tire. And then another day, <laughs> you know, we're sitting, Dad, what's the deal? You keep popping tires. You wouldn't know what was going on. It's like something strange here. So we checked the driveway. We probably thought it was my older brother being silly, fixing. No. We, we, oh, there's nails in our driveway. So we'd sweep the driveway clean. That's kind of strange. Another couple months goes by. <laughs> Happens again. We break another tire. What on earth? There's nails. Someone's throwing nails in our driveway. What's going on? This would go on. It would stop for three or four months. It would happen again. We got magazine subscriptions sent to our house. We got uh, things like that thrown at our house. So what on earth is going on? My mother finally had enough. She said, Dave, I've had enough. 
When mama's had enough, look out. She says, let's get the family together. Let's get the, we're going to pray right now. I, we're going to pray right now. We're going to find out what is going on. In the name of Jesus, Lord, show us what's going on. And my mother got a word of knowledge. Tonight, the person is coming. Well, how do you know, Mom? I just know it in my, when you know it in your knower. She just knew. Because my mother is, you know, has gifts of the Spirit. She said, I know it's going to happen tonight. So I was all excited. Dun, 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 I put the black on, black sweatpants, put a little hat on. My brother was sitting there with his 69 Camaro 350. Four barrel. Anyhow, he was sitting there with his, with his 69 Camaro waiting, uh, kind of hiding with the lights, waiting for this guy to come. Uh, uh, 7 o'clock, nothing happens. 8 o'clock, nothing happens. 9 o'clock, nothing happens. 9.30, a little Volkswagen comes up. <laughs> and he opens the window and throws the nails. My brother chases him, has a reason to speed, and gets his license plate number. We call the police. The police come. It, it was the ex-board member. And so we had an opportunity and so we, we told, we had police went to his house. We didn't, we didn't press charges. We just said, we just want to let you know what's happening. He never threw any more nails in our driveway. Incidentally, he died a horrible death. I'm just telling you the truth, folks. You're bitter like that, you open the door to all kinds of stuff. Wish no harm on anybody. But don't mess with God. Don't mess with me, okay? <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, you know, oh, my God. All right. All right. That was a word of knowledge, okay? It was a fun story, and uh, my mom texted me in the first service. Oh, I just shared that yesterday. Well, that's a fun story. Anyhow, but that's going to be a word of knowledge where you start knowing what's going on. Uh, and then another thing that can happen at the word of knowledge is another situation called a word of wisdom, where you have wisdom how to deal with a set of circumstances. This is dramatically illustrated in the book of Genesis with Joseph. Joseph first gives an interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And he, said, and, and he says, what should I do? This is what you should do. And he gave wisdom. And it was from God. It wasn't from Joseph. He says, I want you to collect this amount of food, tax people this. And it was phenomenal. God will give words of wisdom at what to do. And incidentally, I, I wanted to give a little side note here. I don't want to go off the wreath and path a little bit. Sometimes a word of knowledge, you might have a word of knowledge, and you think you understand its ramifications, but you may not. For example, Agabus in the book of Acts told the apostle Paul, you're going to be bound and, and chained if you go to Jerusalem. Do not go. And so he got a word of knowledge, which is correct, but his application was incorrect. And Paul said, no, I'm supposed to go. So be very, very careful with these spiritual gifts. It's supposed to work in a community of believers. You're not supposed to be a lone ranger, even if you have Tonto. You're supposed to work together in a group. These spiritual gifts work better in community than by yourself. Word of wisdom is a divine answer or solution for a particular event or circumstance. There's been circumstances in our past where God would, would tell my dad, I want you to leave the church right now, and I want you to get out. But God, we can't do it right now. And my dad got a word of wisdom. We're supposed to step out. Step out, and, and that, sounds, that sounds stupid. You got a family of, you got three kids, you're going to step out of your job? Yes. The moment we stepped out was the moment we got a call from a lawyer and said, you are an executor of an estate. And this woman, by the way, was poor, we thought. She ended up leaving us $75,000 the moment he stepped out of the ministry. And later on, we get another 25000 We were able to buy our first house, and we started another church. My dad had a word of wisdom. Step out now. Maybe it's a word of knowledge. See, sometimes they kind of cross-pollinate these two. So I'm, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because we're running out of time here. But the word of wisdom, divine answer or solution. How many of you could use a word of wisdom about your company, about your family, about what's going on with finances? God, what am I supposed to do? Should I have my money in the stock market? Now, don't ask God for a word of wisdom by going to play Powerball. He'll never honor that because that's a dishonorable thing to do. Because it's, it teaches, and that's another topic. But a word of wisdom, divine answer or solution for a particular event, a word of wisdom. Again, we don't have time to go into all of it right now. Another thing we can call it here is, is discerning of spirits. Let me make this clear. Discerning of spirits. What does that mean? It is made aware of the presence of a demonic spirit. You believe in demons? Yes, I do believe in demons. They're not the ones you see on television. They're a fallen angels. Their objective is to mess us up and try to influence us to make bad decisions. Their primary attack is upon our mind. But anyhow, discerning of spirits, made aware of the presence of a demonic spirit. We've seen this happen in our lives. 
There have been circumstances. One time there was a circumstance. I'll, I'll tell you, I, showed, I share with you. There was a circumstance. I don't know what was going on, but I was getting agitated at everything. I mean, I, everything was bothering me. I felt myself like getting enraged. I'm like, what's going on with me, God? I thought the Lord said, pray right now. There's a spirit attacking you. So my wife and I got together. In the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of anger to leave me. And it, whoop, it went. Because I was listening to demon. I just sensed it. We've been to Africa, and we've seen demons manifest there. Okay? We're not blaming demons for everything, but there is demonic presences that can happen. And so discerning of spirits is to tell something is not of God. For example, the apostle Paul was preaching in the book of Acts, and this woman was saying, this little young lady was saying, these are servants of the most high God. These are certain. Now, she's saying the truth. Finally, at the three or four days, he says, hey, stop it. In the name of Jesus, and a demon came out of her. He discerned what was going on. How many of you think you might be able to need, to need to know how to discern what's of God? I've met people that said all the right words, but something inside of me said, there's not something not right with this minister. I don't know what it was. There was a person that I worked with, and I, I didn't have peace about this person I was working for. Something is not right with this guy. Ten years later, this whole ministry crumbled. And, and, you know, so you don't know. Sometimes God will speak to you. Now, let me say something else about this. Discerning of spirits is made aware of the presence of demonic spirit. It does not mean you have the gift of discernment. Go look in the Bible. You can't find it. You have discerning of spirits. People walk around, I discern this. And, and a lot of people throw that, I have the gift of discernment. Basically, they have the gift of criticism. They go around saying, nah, 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 nah. well, the service of the Spirit left here, and, nah, and during their worship service, it was better here. I mean, I've been to a church one time where people said, oh, during their church service today, I got slimed by the demons. Meanwhile, they watched too much Ghostbusters. Meanwhile, other people said the presence of God fell so heavy today. You walk around, and you throw this. You know what I'm talking about, folks? It's, sometimes the spirit of silly gets on people, where it's just, you know, I had discernment. And when God told me, God showed me this. God showed you this. God showed me that. God told me to do this. God told me to do You know what that is? That is breaking the Ten Commandments, taking the Lord's name in vain. I, I don't normally say God told me unless I'm reading from the Bible. I might say, I believe God is showing me this. But I don't walk around saying, God told me this. God told me that. That's just arrogance and foolishness, folks. Be very, very, very careful. And if you're all by yourself in a vacuum, there's a problem. These gifts are supposed to be used in a community of believers where there's accountability. And Jesus is supposed to be exalted, not you or I. So um, I'm going to mention something. Most people who, who tell me they have the gift of discernment have the gift of criticism. Okay? Enough said with that for now. But let me ask you a question. Do you think maybe... God, you might want to ask God, God, what's going on in my family? What's going on with my kids? What's going on in the company? What's going on with our country? What's going on with this? And, you know, I, I, with all the stuff going on right now, I, I have to share a message sometime in the near future, uh, hopefully that we do it sometime soon, to talk about what's going on in our country and, and how people are making these crazy decisions. It's not the people. It's the spirit behind it. And so we have to learn how to discern the spirits. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You're, you're fighting against something over here. Just don't waste your time. Deal it in the spiritual realm first. And that's why you need to know, is this just someone being silly or is there a demonic spirit? And what can happen with a group of people, you pray together, the Lord will speak to you and give you this instruction. We've seen it happen many, many times. That's why it's important for you to get involved with small groups. That's why you're not supposed to live this thing all by yourself. So we have discerning of spirits. Again, we can go a lot deeper. Each one can be a week within itself. Then we have the declarative gifts. These are things you speak out. And one is prophecy. What's prophecy? It's a message of encouragement from God. This is the New Testament prophecy, okay? It's a message of encouragement from God through a person. That's what prophecy, a message of encouragement. Sometimes encouragement is a strong word. I've been encouraged sometimes by my parents, and they had said tough stuff to me, but it was done for the edification of who I was. Okay? Now, look what the Bible has to say about this in the Scriptures. It says this. But he, or she, by the way, he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Do you see that? Edification is building someone else up. It's not building yourself up. Oh, look how smart I am. It's not just shaking our finger at society and thinking that you're some kind of Old Testament prophet. What it is, it's the edification and the exhortation. Now, are there times to speak against society? Absolutely. But you have to have a platform that God has given you. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. So prophetic 
ministry in the New Testament is for edification, exhortation, and comfort to people. It's not about bolstering ourselves up. And so a lot of people go around and say, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet. Really? Yeah. How are you a prophet? Well, I see things wrong. My, you know, it doesn't, take a lot of, it doesn't take a lot of wisdom to find things wrong. Seriously. There are people right now that sit in their basements or in their easy chairs with pajamas on all day, and they sit there and read articles, and they write little things at the bottom of the article. You know what I'm talking about? They criticize everything. I mean, being critical, you know, God is always about bringing correction to bring something up, not to destroy something. So we'd be very careful about these types of things. All right, so the next one I want to bring to your attention is also the following. Just, the Bible says this, for you can all prophesy. We know what all means in the scriptures? All Christians, all prophesy, all can prophesy. God wants all of us to prophesy, to build up, to be people that bring people and encourage each other, exhortation, and the building up. For you can all prophesy, okay? That's what the Bible says. One by one that all may learn and all may be in Encouraged. It's not about me flexing my spiritual muscles. I got a cape on with a big S on my shirt. I'm a super, sp no, it's, it's all prophesy that they may all learn and be encouraged. If it's about you, it's not probably about God. It's about building up the body of Christ. For all can prophesy, but one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. The Bible also says, let the prophets be subject to the prophets and the spirit of the prophets, so that your prophecy should be judged by other believers. Again, we're not called to do this in a vacuum all by ourselves. I'm a prophet on the, on the outside of the desert but by myself. Okay, we have that. We have the declarative gifts. We have tongues. Oh, here we go. Yes, we're going to go there. But let me stop there for a second, though. Tongues is not something to be scared of, folks. Okay? If you've been beat up, if you've been in services where someone's laid hands on your head and said, repeat after me, Kawasaki motorcycles are fast. Or, or say after me, should have bought a Honda, not a Cadillac. Okay? That, please. And, and, and they don't let you go. And, and you're like, I want to be let, let me out of here. What happened to me one time? They were praying over me. They wouldn't leave me alone. So I made something up. Should have bought a Honda, should have bought a Honda. Oh, he's got it. Praise God. <laughs> leave me alone. Okay? That happened to me, by the way. Then later on, I got prayed for and something really happened where I got spiritual language. Okay? And so I want to talk to you about a few more. We're going to have a whole sermon on this alone because it needs to be demythed. Okay? It's not the most important, but it's been probably the most misunderstood gift there is. Tongues is a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. Okay? Tongues is a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. Now let me explain that a little bit to you here. The Bible says this. Therefore, how is it supposed to function in church? The Bible says, therefore, if the whole church comes together, we're talking about a large gathering, not talking about small groups, a large gathering, comes together in one place and all speak with tongues. This is 1 Corinthians, by the way. And there come in those who are Uninformed. These are Christians that are not aware of what's going on. They have not, been, they have not learned about spiritual gifts. They're a little bit ignorant about it, okay? They're not stupid. They're ignorant, okay? Uh, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers. I love my wife tremendously. I really do. But I'm, imagine in the middle of the service, I, I go down there right now, I'm going to embarrass my wife, and I start, I start doing that kind of, you know what I'm talking about? You know, passionate kissing. Is it appropriate? Absolutely. But is it appropriate in a crowd of people? No. I'll give it a little peck in the cheek or maybe kiss in the lips or maybe the Colombian kiss. I don't understand that one. Why do you touch? That's what they do in Colombia. Okay. In other cultures, I went to Italy and I got kissed by the guys and kissed them. Like, you get away from me. Okay. Okay. But um, so <laughs> lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. Uninformed and unbelievers. It's appropriate, but not in this kind of context, all right? And so we have people that come to our church. And by the way, if you're searching about your faith, good. I searched about my faith. For six months, I wasn't quite sure if God was really it and Jesus was the Son of God. But I searched. This is a place, if you're searching, we welcome you that. We're not going to be upset with you because we believe the truth, and we're not afraid of the truth. So if you're still trying to figure it out, we want to freak you out. 
or if you're uninformed. This is for everybody, okay? So, um, comes together in one place, and all speak in tongues, and they're coming, those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say you're what? Out of your mind. They're crazy. They're nuts. I've been to services where it's just been all of us believe in God. All of us believe God, all function spiritual gifts, and we had some crazy things happen, but it was in the right context. I can tell you some stuff that will blow your mind away. Seriously. I'm afraid to tell you right now because I can't have enough time to explain it. I've seen some wild stuff that God has done in a group of people. But we were all in the same, we, we, it wasn't uninformed and there wasn't unbelievers. And this church, every week we have people come up and meet people drive by and say, I don't know why I'm coming here. You go to any church? No. I just feel like I need to come here. Someone invited me. And they're searching. We want to give dignity and help to that, okay? So that's part of it. There's a, purpose, there's a context for these things to be utilized. And sometimes, for example, let me give you an example of what has happened. My dad uh, one time went to a service full of pastors, and some guy got up and spoke in tongues. My dad sent him right in the middle of his chest. He felt like this, this ugh, I know what he's talking about. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm brand new here. No one knows who I am. I don't want to say anything. Finally, they wait and wait. Someone gets up. There's someone right here right now that's brand new, and they're saying, God, I will not say it because I'm brand new. God says, say it. My dad's like, okay. So he said the word. There's been times where, uh, where uh, I have, I've heard a tongue, and I'm like, I knew what, I knew what it was. But I didn't want to say it because I was a new guy in the church. You know what I'm saying? I just, you know, I just don't want to get up there. And, I'm on vacation or something. I can't remember where I was, but I was in a church uh, when I was in graduate school afterwards, and I didn't want to say anything. And someone got up and spoke the interpretation. It was exactly what I got. So stuff like that, this definitely happens. Yes, it really happens, folks. You don't have to be weird about it. You don't have to walk around like a Jedi Knight. You don't have to play Jedi mind tricks. Okay, you don't have to do all that, okay? Come, and those who are uninformed or unbelievers will say that you are out of your can, okay? Okay, we'll get more into that in the future, right? Then we have the declarative gifts. We have interpretations of tongues, which I just share with you about it. There's the prayer language that you speak in tongues privately to God, and the Bible says that. Apostle Paul says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But it, it edifies me. But at a public gathering, it's, it should not be. For example, it says, um, we we'll go next to this next one here. Interpretation, understanding and expressing the thought of the intent of the message in tongues. Okay, you hear a message in tongues, you actually get the interpretation of it. Now, look what the Apostle Paul says here. Now, who speaks to the Apostle Paul? Remember we mentioned earlier, who speaks to the Apostle Paul? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is the Holy Spirit. I wish you all spoke with tongues. Now, why would the Holy Spirit say, I wish you all spoke in tongues? We're not going to answer that today. But could it be that you're missing on an opportunity? But even more, here we go, that you prophesy, that, that you prophesied. Why? For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks into I See, we shouldn't have tongues in church anymore because prophecy is greater. Yes, but unless indeed there's interpretation. You see that? If I speak in tongues, you know what you're talking about, right? What good is it? Unless there's an interpretation. It's equal if there's an interpretation. Why? Indeed, he who interprets that the what? The church may be receive edification. It's not about showboating. It's not about walking around throwing jackets at people and doing weird stuff to make yourself flamboyant. It's not about you. Jesus didn't do that. It's about edifying believers. All right? Um, let's move forward as we continue to talk about this. For all, look what he says here. I'm getting used to using the screen, guys. I'm just trying to, I'd read some of the scripture, make it find it a little easier this way. So that's all part of it. So we have the situation of tongues and all that. Then we have the dynamic gifts called faith. And what's, what's the gift of faith? It's a supernatural impartation or a belief and confidence for a specific situation where you have faith. There's been circumstances where I, one time in a Good Friday service, I said, I know God's going to heal someone from their back tonight. I just know it. And sure enough, God had a chronic back problem for over 15 years. His back was healed. It's still good now. Uh, when it was time to build this church, I had a gift of faith. I, it's going to happen. People would say, you can't do it. I said, I believe God has told us to do it. And we're going to be able to do it. We're going to be able to raise a million dollars. How? I don't know, but God told me we're going to do it. We're a church of 160. We're going to do it. 
And what happened? We've done it, right? Because I had a word of faith. I believe. There's been times I pray for situations, and I had faith. How many of you could use faith for your children? How many could use faith for a new job? How many of you could use faith for a situation you're struggling with? Do we not need gifts of faith? Absolutely. Okay, so we should look for these types of things. Another one we have here, again, we don't have time to go into all of them right now. We have gifts of healings. And that's supernatural endowments of divine health. How many of you could use divine health? I know I could, right? Gifts of healings. We also have working of miracles. Again, we could go a week in each one of these, but I just want to give you a quick flyby. We'll get into some of these later on. Working of miracles. What's a miracle? The divine, oh, let me go back to this one for a second. We've had people healed of cancer. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have experienced healings? Divine. Look around. Doctor said, I don't know what happened. We have a gentleman in our church. I'm going to ask for permission first. He had back surgery. Okay? It was so bad, they had to put plates in his back with screws. Okay? He went to a meeting. He was a musician in the meeting. He got prayed for. He felt heat in his back. Had no more, went back to the doctor, took x-rays. Guess what? They couldn't find the plates or the screws. Now, I'm not making this up. There's a person I know that this happened to. Maybe I'll have him share sometime. And this guy is solid. He's not some kind of guy who makes up stories. We've seen God do incredible things with gifts of healings. And then we also have working of miracles. And miracles would be like praying for something. Like we, I know I've heard a missionary that went 800 miles in a tank of gas. It just doesn't happen. Where God has done things for people, or different missionaries I've spoken to, where they've smuggled Bibles and no one saw it. I mean, th things like that. Working of miracles, praying for storms to stop, or the divine intervention that alters the na na nature, natural circumstances. How many of you could use that? God, would you please work in a situation? I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but we need a miracle in our finances. We need a miracle with our, with our, our, our thing. I mean, I've even my, one time <laughs> we had a situation where the car broke down. They laid hands on it, and it got better. Isn't that amazing? Anyhow, so, uh, so there's working of miracles that can happen. So these are just some of the things that we see in Scripture that God wants to do in us. And I just wanted to, as we worship team makes their way up, I just wanted to bring some things to your attention today. And I think you understand something. We don't want to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are for the body of Christ. It's not for showboating. It's not for I'm this, I'm that. If you ever feel the inclination to feel you're better than somebody else, it's not of God, it's of your flesh or of the enemy. Jesus gave away gifts to the church. Jesus wanted all of us to get it. Spiritual gifts are for today. You may be afraid of it. The Holy Spirit is for today. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit wants to anoint you. He wants you not to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Perhaps we'll have a seminar in the fall or something to help us work through and through small groups where we can start exercising these gifts, not to showboat, but to make a difference in the world. We need the move of God more than ever before in our world. And you have not because you ask not. And many of us are afraid. Listen, if you'll be open to it, watch what God will do through you and through me if we believe it. Let's bow our heads, please. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much that the spiritual gifts are here for today. Lord, I want to thank you that you are here, Lord God, to not only save us, but to empower us with your spirit. Father, I pray right now that you'd open the area of faith, that we begin to believe. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd come, that you would touch us, that you would fill us, O oh God. We know what you said, you have not because you asked not. And you said if you ask, if you ask for a piece of bread, will you give you a stone or a serpent? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So Holy Spirit, we need you today. We ask you to come fill us with gifts that we could be a blessing to others, that we could see you built up and build up the body of Christ and make a difference in this world. Lord, I just pray right now that fear of all these things would stop. We pray that, Lord, there be an enablement of your spirit upon this church. We be known to be a church that's supernaturally natural, that we reach out, that we love each other, God, that we make a difference, and that we would honor you above all, not unto me, but unto you be the glory. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, I do this every single week because it's the most important question you got to ask you. Are you, do you have Christ in your life?
You know, if you're on a ship and it's sinking, and let's suppose you're, you're in a ship and it's sinking, and a lifeboat comes up, and they say, here, jump on the lifeboat. You say, yeah, I believe there's a lifeboat there. I believe it can carry me off the sinking ship. But just because you believe in it doesn't make it good enough. What do you got to do? You got to jump out of the sinking ship, and you got to jump into the lifeboat to receive the lifeboat. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins that you and I can never do. You can't save yourself. And by the way, don't try to get your act together first. It's like taking a shower before you take a shower. It's kind of silly, right? You don't take a shower before you take a shower. You just get in the shower. And so Jesus says, come as you are. I love you just the way you are. But come to me, and I'll help you get through the rest. And so I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you're willing to do this, today can be your new day. Let's pray right now, quietly in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. All the things I've done wrong, I, I give them to you right now in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me, both known and unknown. And this day, I declare, I'm handing you over the keys to my life. You are now in charge, and I'm not. Help me, God, to walk your way. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to fill me, to empower me, to walk the path you have for me today. I give my life today for the first time, or I recommit my life to you today. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, you say, Pastor, real quick. I Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Give me a quick show of hands. Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. I'm giving my life. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Come on. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Amen. There's a four or five of you this morning. Listen, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. You can all stand, please. Prayer team, make their way up. If five of you or six of you just raise your hand. In this card here, it says this. I accepted Jesus today as my Lord and Savior for the very first time. If you can fill that out and fill out your information, give it to one of the folks in front or put it in one of the boxes in back. All right? We want to encourage you today. You're welcome to come to the Growth Track class today. We have it every week and catch up. Doesn't make a difference what order it's in. We want to encourage you to come to that. Listen, we can walk this out together. God has a purpose and a plan for our lives today. Amen, everybody? Thank you for listening and thank you for being attentive this morning. God bless you. Good, good fun. It's who you are. It's who you are. If you need prayer for anything reason at all, come forward at this time. We want to pray with you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Lord bless you. Let's go after God with all we have. Let's walk in the power of the Spirit, not our own power. And let's walk and be the people God's called us to become. God bless you. If you need prayer, we're going to leave these open. Stay as long as you like. Otherwise, we, we dismiss you. We'd love to have you come to Grove Track. we get extra spots today. God bless you.